Good morning. Was that an awesome time of worship? Or what? Boy, I had a great time. If you, if you didn't worship in that, I tell you, then you need to get your worshiper thing fixed, you know, because uh, <laughs> that, uh, that was good worship. I tell you, God is so good. How many, how many know that we need to know the love of God more? Amen? We know it here, but if we know it here, it would change everything because perfect love casts out all fear. And, and if you're honest, a lot of us, uh, how many are ever tempted to fear? nowadays, right? A lot of us. If you're, lying, if, you're, if you're not saying that, then you're lying about fear. But, right, so many things. Health, finances, government, <laughs> you know, craziness. But uh, how do we know when you keep your eyes on God, His perfect love casts all fear. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 11. How many have enjoyed the study in Daniel? You've enjoyed it? Amen. Not because I'm teaching it, but the book of Daniel is so good. Uh, I, I tell you, I've just been learning so much. How many know the book of Daniel is not for wimps? You've got to have a brain cell to, to say the book of Daniel. It's deep, and today's going to be deep also, so I need you to wake up, and hopefully that coffee's kicked in. But uh, the title of today's message is The Man of Sin, Part 1. The Man of Sin. How many know who the Man of Sin is? Who is that? The Antichrist. And so we're going to study that today. We're going to learn. We're going to kind of do get ready to talk about the Antichrist but uh, and let's hope it's going to end well. It's not going to be ending where we focus on the Antichrist because that would kind of be a discouragement. But how many know the people of this world will say things like this? How many have heard this? Well, if God is a God of love, why does he allow floods, earthquakes, famine, war, murder? But we need to remember that this world has been take, taken captive by Satan. And his only desire is what? To steal kill and destroy. That's what Jesus said in John 10.10. And we have to realize that. Hear this. Jesus, how many know, won the war. He won the war on the cross. He said it's finished. He defeated sin and death. He's defeated Satan. But how many know this? That we still have battles. Amen? Satan is still, he, he's, we have authority in Christ. All authority has been given to Jesus. And now he says in Luke 10, 18 and 19, he's given us all authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and all power over the enemy and nothing should injure you. But how many know we have to exercise that authority? And one of the ways we do that is through prayer. And how many know, if we're honest, a lot of us don't pray like we should. Amen? And so that's why I believe the enemy is kind of doing what he's been doing. But how many are feeling a call to pray more? How many, how many are feeling that? Hopefully three of you. Good. No, okay. Hopefully all of us. Because we see the enemy. How many know you don't see the enemy? I don't think too many of us have seen a demon or seen Satan. But how many know we see his effects in our country? Amen? We see the effects, and and Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against the Democrats. We don't wrestle against this administration. We wrestle against demonic powers that are behind it, and that's who we should be warring with in the Spirit through prayer. Amen? Amen? And so we have to know that he still has kind of a hold on this world. Jesus called Satan the ruler or prince of this world. Amen? And I'll hear people, it's funny, I'll hear a lot of charismatics say, well, I don't really have time for the devil. You know, the devil, oh, he's so filthy. How many know this one person who said that just almost died the other, other month ago? And how many know, I always I said this to, to, to our staff, I said that he might not have time for the devil, but how many know the devil has time for him? And we need to be aware, right? Because if you say there's no such thing as ISIS, they go, thank you, right? They love that. Right? The devil loves, you know, I told you 40% of evangelicals do not believe in a literal Satan or demons. How many of those people are getting rocked? Amen? Because if you believe the Bible and you believe Jesus, he said there's a real devil and there's real demons, and we need to know that. But he called him the ruler of this world. The apostle Paul called Satan the God, small g, God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Hear this. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, Right? God is in control of the whole earth. But how many know he's allowed Satan still to be the God or ruler of this world system? Do you understand that? And so we have to know that. And until the Lord comes back, that's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Once he comes back, once he sets up his millennial kingdom, how many know then Satan will be bound and then God's will be done on the earth? But until then, there's always going to be this cosmic battle for God's will to be done. Everyone agree with that? Everyone track with me? So that's that. But, but hear this to kind of show that how people see that God is responsible. And I, I, my point I want you to see is that Satan is the one who's causing the stealing, the war, the famine, the murder, the sickness, the disease. And we need to know that. Amen? Because how many know you don't hear people say, blank Satan, right? You never hear anyone curse and use Satan's name. 
but you hear people use God's name, right? And you see insurance companies will say the same thing. They'll promote this lie by calling what? Whenever there's a disaster, they say what? If there's an earthquake famine, they'll say it's an act of God. Now, how many know God? That's not true because Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. It's Satan who wants to steal. It's Satan who wants to How many know? Perfect example, ISIS. Radical Islam, what do they want to do? They believe the lie that if they cause chaos, it'll bring forth their imam. It'll bring forth their messiah. Do you see that? How many know that's the enemy, man? It's the enemy deceiving and saying, cause chaos. How many know, did you read this? That, that ISIS was proud that they killed over 5,200 people during the time of Ramadan. How many know that's a sick religion when you say, when you're proud, I mean radical Islam, I should say. How many know that's sick when you are proud of killing people? Amen? We should be proud of what? Saving people, right? To seek and to save. We should be proud. Hey, I killed 5,200 people. That's wrong. It's not good. And so anyways, um, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly or life to the fullest. How many like that plan better, right? So that's Jesus. As we also saw last week in Daniel 10, how many were here for last week? How many raised your hand? How many liked last week? I I liked last week. I I preached a record last week. I I almost did. Well, I preached an hour and 20 minutes. How many? do Do you know you're getting four sermons in one? Do you know the average pastor preaches like 20 minutes? I preached for an hour and 20 before. I, last week was an hour and 14 minutes. You guys are awesome. I'll tell you this, you know? Because, I mean, how many know we are ADD people, right? Squirrel, squirrel. And, you know, that's why I move all over because I'm trying to keep your attention, right? Because I know how hard it's to sit in a chair and listen to somebody. I, I love what one of my Bible teachers said. He says, the brain can only take in as much as the seat can endure. Right? That's why we have really nice chairs for you to be able to hopefully endure me, but uh, hopefully you love the Word of God. But, but uh, if you didn't, weren't here for last week for Daniel 10, I encourage you to get it. Amen? Because, not because I'm such a good preacher again, but because it spoke on how it showed us how to pray. Did it encourage you to pray, anyone? It encouraged me to pray because it shows you spiritual warfare, and you need to understand that we are in a war. And if you don't know that, you will be taken out or you will be defeated. You will not walk in the abundant life that Jesus has for you. Dan 10, the angel told Daniel, the first day you prayed, Daniel prayed and fasted. He says, the Gabriel, the archangel said, the first day you prayed, your words, your prayers were heard. Now we have to remember that he had been praying for 21 days. So if his, if his prayer was heard on the first day, why did it take 21 days for that to be that prayer to be answered. Because why? We saw last week that there was a spiritual battle. We saw he prayed, and then what happened? The angel came to answer Daniel's prayer, but the prince of Persia, this demonic strong man or stronghold over Persia, which is modern day Iran, how many know that strong man is probably still there, right? And he bound him, he wrestled him. And isn't that weird? It's weird to picture that, isn't it? That that angel, you just think angels go, swing, done, but there's this battle, even with angels. And how many, I asked you last week, how many read the book, uh, This Present Darkness? Anyone read it? If you haven't read it and you kind of want to understand this, read that book. It's a long, it's kind of an allegory, but it's based on Daniel 10, and it'll really give you kind of a picture. I mean, it's an allegory. It's, not, it's, not, it's based on the Bible, but it's a, it's a story, but it really kind of shows you the spiritual warfare, and it'll really help you to pray. I'm, I'm reading it again, and it's really helping me. Answers to our prayers can be delayed, as I said, because of demonic spiritual forces. And as I said last week, think about this. What if Daniel had quit praying on the 20th day? He probably wouldn't have answered prayer. Think about that for us. We quit after playing, praying 20 seconds. Amen? Remember what amen means? It doesn't mean it's, it's like so be it. It means it's true, right? A sad true, right? Amen. It's true. A lot of times we quit. But think about it. We've got to learn to persevere in prayer. Because James says you have not because you ask not. Jesus said, knock, and the door will be open to you. Seek, and you will find. Ask, and it will be given to you. Keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking. But we seek for five minutes. We go, ah, man. Yeah. But I tell you, we've got to get to a place. You guys awake out there? Hello? We've got to get to a place where we start seeing answered prayers. Because how many know our country is slipping? It's slipping. And, and it's so funny, and I don't want to get on you too much, but it's just my gift. But, but hear this is, 
We will all say we need revival. We'll all say our country's slipping. We'll all say we need an awakening and turn back to God, right? But then I'll say, okay, and then what's the answer? What's every revival? Prayer. And then I'll say, how many want to pray? If I said, hey, we're going to have a prayer meeting this Wednesday at, 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 for 7 to 8, we're going to pray, or 7 to 9. How many know a lot of you would be a little busy? And that's the problem, amen? Amen? amen. Because we have to get, and hear this, guys, I don't want it to get so bad that we have to pray because there's nothing else to do because we don't have our jobs, we don't have a country anymore. I want us to seek the Lord while he still may be found, when things are good. Amen? Amen. I want to seek the Lord because he says, in, in, and I believe it's Psalms 34, he says, don't be like the horse. Don't have to be like the mule. It has to be led by bitter bridle or not folly. Don't be foolish. Don't be stubborn. Come to God because it's right. Amen? And how many know this, guys? Can you admit this? I've committed to pray, and I'll tell you, does, there's not very many distractions in our life, is there? My phone, hey, look over here, look over here, look over here. I mean, you have to fight to pray. You have to, you talk about discipline, you got to be serious about it, because if you're not, you will not pray. Amen? Something's going to come. And then how many of you love this one? I said this, you all relate to this. When you pray, all of a sudden you're praying, then you think of all the things you need to do on the house, right? Or all the things you need to clean. It doesn't bother you when you're watching a movie, Right? I don't see people go, oh my goodness, i got to paint the house right now. No, but it bothers us in the middle of prayer, doesn't it? And that's the enemy because he, and hear that guys, be encouraged. The reason that happens is because the devil knows how powerful prayer is. That's why he's fighting it. So let that discouragement or the distraction spur you on to press in because that's how powerful prayer is. That he's trying to do everything, get you to do anything but pray. Amen? So there you go. That was all free too. People say, yeah, we get in trouble when it's free, Craig. But anyways, move on. Chapter 11 here, we come to the message that Gabriel is now going to bring, the answer to Daniel's prayer. He's bringing it to Daniel. And if anyone stayed home today to watch soap operas, hopefully none of you watch soap operas, right? None of you would admit it if you did. But if, if anyone stayed home, how many know they're missing out because today's lesson is going to be like a soap opera? This is going to be amazing. I'll tell you, you got to keep your thinking caps on, but this is going to be like a soap opera. Hereafter, Daniel wrestled in prayer for 21 days. Daniel is given a bird's eye view prophetically, and you and I today are given a bird's eye view of about 370 years from, from the day he got this word, 370 years of prophecy and of the events that would happen in the Middle East. Scholars have tabulated that in this chapter alone, chapter 11, that there is over 135 specific prophecies. How many know that's pretty amazing? It's almost like your God knows everything. That's a joke. He does, right? Okay, wake up. You're like, does he? Yeah, yeah oh yeah, he does, right? The Bible says in, in Hebrews 4.13, the eyes of the Lord, everything is laid bare before the eyes of the Lord to whom we must give an account. He knows everything. So it's easy for God to speak to his people like Daniel or speak to us people who pray to show prophecy, to show things before they happen. Daniel 11 is fulfilled. As I said, it's the, these prophecies are fulfilled to the minutest detail, just so minute amazing. Now, a lot of the higher critics, how many know that in our seminaries today, I call them cemeteries, because not all seminaries are bad, but a lot of them are. How many know that? The Phoenix Seminary is a good one here in, in, in Arizona, but most seminaries are cemeteries because there are higher critics that, how many know, instead of letting the Bible judge them, they judge the Bible. They shred the Bible. They say, oh, that couldn't be true, this. And so they say that, that Daniel is so accurate that it couldn't be true because it's too accurate. So they say the book of Daniel was written 400 years after the date that it was said it was written, and it was not written by Daniel at all. Well, hear that. If that's true, then your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a liar. How many know that? Because Jesus quoted from Daniel. And, and if, Dan, if Jesus quotes you, how many know that's true? Right? Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus quotes him in Matthew 24, 15. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, how do we know what that is? That's when the tribulation period happens and when Satan, who's looked like this, Antichrist looks like the Savior, then all of a sudden, he, three and a half years into tribulation, he sets up an image of himself in the temple and says, worship me, I am God, not your Jehovah God, I am God, and that's the abomination of desolation. Spoken of Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place. He says, when you see that, whoa, it's, that's it. Jesus quoted him, and how many know that makes it true? 
Amen? So critics that say that. How, how many know these higher critics want to take everything supernatural out of the Bible? I don't know about you. I want things supernatural. Amen? I don't want to be a charismatic, you know, charismaniac where it's like, ooh, ooh, everything's crazy and you're just insane. But I want to see miracles again. Amen? I want to see miracles. I want to believe. Jesus said that you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You know what I mean? That, that you'll, you'll be able to prophesy. And how many know we need those gifts today? done decently in order, and we need to believe for them. And, and the, as Jesus said, the Bible says in Hebrews that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and we need to still believe that. Amen? Amen. Jesus would not have quoted Daniel, as I said, if his prophecies were a lie, because Jesus is truth. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you so much for the sweet time of worship, for the anointing on that. And now, Lord, I ask, For your anointing, not on your word. Your word is from you. It's anointed. But I pray that as I interpret, as I explain your word, expositorily explain your word, I ask that you would anoint my tongue. I pray, Lord, that I would not say anything beyond your word, but I would not shrink back to preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul said. God, let me speak your words. May your words be come alive to us. Your word is a living and active, but Lord, awaken our hearts and minds to where you speak to us, to where we go, my goodness, that was a rhema word. That was a specific word for me, and I heard God. Lord, you said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, it says their hearts will be revealed, and they'll say, surely God is in your midst. I pray that for everyone here, that it's not so much my ability of preaching, but it's your spirit speaking through your word. So speak to us. Just Let's just say that to him humbly. Speak to us, Lord. Just speak, Lord. Just like, just like Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We ask for you to speak to us. And we pray that your word would not just be a history lesson, but it would touch us and change us forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Verse 1 of Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> Also in the first year of Darius, the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now, verse 2, and now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. The fourth shall be the far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. At this point in Daniel's life, the Babylonians have been overthrown King Nebuchadnezzar has been overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. And now the Persians are in power in Babylon. The angel says, Gabriel the angel, we believe it's Gabriel, that the three Persians are in power and three kings are going to be in, come in a row. And the fourth one, Artaxerxes, shall be richer than the rest and stir up the entire, king, stir the entire kingdom against Greece. Now, we don't know why he wanted to get it, come against Greece, but he just did. That's exactly what happened. The fourth king, Xerxes, he was determined to wipe Greece off the face of the earth. With his vast wealth, he spent four years, hear this, raising an army of two and a half million men. How many know that's a big army today? But back then with that population, that was a huge mega army. So two and a half men, two two. 2.5 million men, he took seven days, hear this, to march the men across in boats that attacked, that acted as a bridge. That what they did, they went to the Aegean Sea and they went to the islands of Greece and they just put boat after boat and these seven, 2.5 million men walked across boats like a land bridge. I mean, that's pretty cool. That's pretty wild. It must be kind of crazy going from boat to boat, but they did it. Took them seven days to do that. They crossed the Aegean Sea into the region of Greece. The battle, we are told through historians, was the bloodiest battle, one of the bloodiest battles in history. As the Greeks fought against Artaxerxes and his two and a half million men, although the Greeks lost, the army of Artaxerxes, his two and a half million men, were decimated too. They were rocked by uh, the Greeks. So they won, but they won barely, and they were all lost. For the next 150 years, the Greeks were waiting to take their ve- revenge on the Persians. And here it is. It's kind of like a soap opera. Didn't I say this? So here it is. Dun, dun, dun. So verse 3. Then a mighty king shall arise and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Verse 4. And when he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds, or you could say four generals, we'll see in a moment, four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity or his children, nor according to his dominion, 
which he ruled, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. 150 years later, a mighty king did indeed arise, and maybe you've heard of him, Alexander the Great. How many heard of Alexander the Great? Because he's great, right? He was pretty powerful. 32 years old, he conquered the known world. And he took all his anger of the Greeks and, reven- and get, got revenge for the Greeks. He basically conquered the whole known world by the time he was 32 years old. Can you imagine? I bet you that boy was a little bit cocky. What do you bet? Conquered the known world at 32 years of age. He had, he had conquered the entire world. But hear this. He died at 32. Here this guy conquers the whole known world, and it's said by historians, you know, that people always argue this stuff, but, but I like it. But he says he, he, he cried, it's saying there was no more worlds to conquer, so he cried. And I think of the scripture that says, what does it mean to gain the whole world and lose your soul in the strife? Here he is, he gained everything, conquered the whole world, but yet he's crying because there's no more worlds to conquer. Because why? He doesn't know God. And how many know if you have everything, but you don't have God, you have nothing? And so he's crying. And so what happens is he gets with his guys. They get party. They drink. They, hey, we conquered the world. And he gets drunk. He walks home in the rain, lays on his bed, gets a fever, and dies, a lot of people say, of pneumonia. And so he died shortly thereafter. Following his death, his son didn't take over the kingdom. But his kingdom was divided between four of his generals. And now the story, the soap opera, no, begins We'll focus on two areas or two of Alexander's generals. We're going to focus on just two of them because if not, we'd be here all day. The families, and here's where you have to put your thinking caps on. They'll be up here soon. Look at this. The families, there's two generals' families. There's two generals, and here's their names. The families of the Antiochus or Seleucid family. That's one general, and a lot of times we'll say Seleucid and Antiochus. Seleucids and Antiochus. And then... The Ptolemies, you don't pronounce the P, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, hear this, were in Syria, directly north of Israel. And that's why we're going to mention them, because they're kind of sandwiched between Israel. So the, the Seleucids were in Syria, directly north of Israel. The Ptolemies were in Egypt, directly south of Israel. Now, you would say, why are these so important? Because they surround Israel. And Israel is about is going to be kind of Uh, caught in the middle of these two kingdoms or these two generals. Verse 5, also the king of the south, who's the king of the south? Ptolemies, right? Egypt, south, south, um, shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and give dominion. His dominion shall be great a great dominion. Verse 6, And at the end of some years, they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority. Neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up and those who brought her. And with him who begot her, And with him who strengthened her in in those times. That's a lot of words, isn't it? I tell you, it's amazing, you know, the prophecies. I mean, you really need to study this stuff because it's deep. Rather than fight the Syrians, Ptolemy from the south proposed that they form an alliance. And he says, I have a daughter. This is when Antiochus said, I have a a daughter, Antiochus said, uh, Bernice. And he says, marry her, that, that, and that will make us one big family, like Alexander the Great wanted us to be. But, but here Antiochus said, I, I can't be married, I can't get married, because I'm already married. Well, Ptolemy said, dump her, so Antiochus agreed. A wedding took place, but soon after, Ptolemy died, and Antiochus decided he wanted his old wife back. How I many? that's not a good thing? When you have a wife and you dump her for a new wife and you get a new family and you're, you're, the kids you had with her are not going to be on the throne now, how many know there's a saying what? No, hell has no fury like a woman scorned. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. Here's the soap opera. She returns to him all, oh, yes, it'd be great to come back. Oh, yes. And she comes back. And what she does is she kills Ptolemy. She kills Ptolemy's, oh, sorry, she kills, she kills uh, 
kills him, and then she kills Ptolemy's daughter, Berenice, and then kills her child as well. How many know that's pretty wild? That's a soap opera, amen? So it just, so she's like, she comes in nice, and but she says, oh, kick me off the, kick my children off the throne, kick my kids, you're done, baby. And how many know she did that and Keep the gas cans away. That's all I can say. If you remember that from the old days, right? I mean, wow. Uh, verse 7 of Daniel 11. But from a branch of her roots, when shall arise in his place, who shall come with the army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail? Verse 8. And he shall also carry their gods captive. I mean, that's not good when you can cap- carry someone's gods. But carry their gods captive and eat to Egypt and their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Verse 9. Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Enraged by what happened to his sister, Ptolemy's son from the south, Ptolemy III, gathered an army, marched through Israel, and did in the Seleucid family. And while he was there, he, hear this, he rescued 2,500 gods the Syrians had stolen from Egypt years earlier. How many know it's pretty sad when you have to rescue your own god? Yeah. Or gods? How many know your god should be rescuing you, right? Lord, rescue us, right? How many know if we go, we got to rescue God, God is stuck in Syria, let's go get God. That's sad. <laughs> Okay, and that's how silly it is when you follow idols. And, you know, it's funny. We put down, oh, they follow idols. How many of we have idols, right? Your phone can be an idol. Your spouse can be an idol, right? Remember what an idol is. An idol is anything you put before God. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's anything you put before God. And I know none of you put your phone before God. You ever see kids? Whatever. And, you know, I mean, we, we have a lot of idols. Amen. We have a lot of idols, and we have to say, we should pray, Lord, show me the things that grieve you and quench you. Show me the things that hinder you in my life. And I believe that he would show us that there are gods. You know, We might not have to go rescue our gods, but how many know we have to get rid of some of our gods or put them in the proper place? How many know when you have a quiet time, you know it's quiet time, you need to put your phone over here, or you need to do what I did. I used to do my study on my phone. But how many know I have too many alerts and too many prompts, too many drudge reports popping up? I need to either, what I've done is I've got a tablet with no prompts, right? Because we need to have things. I mean, I love technology, amen? But we've got to make sure we have that time where we're quiet before God. Amen? Yeah. You guys are getting quiet on me. <laughs> Verse 10. However, his sons, the north, northern boys, the Seleucid boys, shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. In response to the, the, to Ptolemy, in response to Ptolemy's invasion, Antiochus III, there's a lot of Antiochuses, so you've got to just get, I can't remember them all, but here it is, trust me. Antiochus III launched a counterattack against Egypt. In the process, he claimed Israel as part of his empire that Egypt had claimed earlier in the past. See that? So Egypt had had Israel. Now they come. Syrian comes down and says, we're claiming Israel now. And you see how Israel is just getting bounced back and forth. And that's why we hear this. So Israel is like caught in the crossfire. Verse 11. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out to fight with him, with the king of the north who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. Verse 12, when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will be cast down tens, cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. Verse 13, the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with great army and much equipment. Verse 14, now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. Back and forth the battle goes. Back and forth the battle went on. Now centering in Israel, finally Antiochus from the Seleucid family in the north. 
Antiochus V came on the scene and determined to solve the problem once and for all. So he persuaded the Greeks to join him in invading Egypt or the north, or the south, I'm sorry, invading them once again, verse 15. So the king of the north came and built a siege mound and, and, and take a fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. Verse 16, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land, the glorious land is Israel, with destruction in his power. Verse 17, and, sh- and he shall also set his face to enter with strength of his whole king- kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of the women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. The tensions are beginning to ease, believe it or not, between Antiochus in the north and the house of Ptolemy in the south. And here's what happens. All of a sudden, Antiochus said, you know, I've got a beautiful daughter and you have a son. I'll ship my daughter down to Egypt. She'll hang out there, wait for your son to grow up. You talk about the cradle rival. He was only about five years old. And she's kind of like 20 or something. So he says, I'll wait for your son to grow up. She'll wait, and then you can, they can be married. And he, Antiochus, was really after, what he's really after was his daughter, to be, his daughter to be inside the palace of the Ptolemies to act as a spy. The woman's name was, maybe you've heard of her, Cleopatra. Cleopatra. And so here's Cleopatra, right, this great lover, but, you know, she, she loved more than just him, but at first she falls in love. She's supposed to be a spy, but then she ends up falling in love with the son, and she refused to spy on the house of Ptolemy. So now Antiochus is pretty torqued. He's pretty mad. So here it is at verse 18. After this, I told you it was a soap opera, didn't I? It's a lot of history, but it's pretty wild, right? I mean, this is better than days of our life. I mean, this is pretty wild. Verse 18, after this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to, the end, to an end and with the reproach removed, and he shall turn back on him. Antiochus from the north then turns his face. He's frustrated because he couldn't get his daughter to spy on the Ptolemy family. So now he turns his face towards the Greek isles again, towards the Greeks, determined to conquer them. But when he went north to vent his frustration by conquering the Greek islands, he came into contact with the emerging Roman Empire. How many of the Romans were pretty powerful? And so he realized he couldn't go. They stopped him and said, hey, you're not going through us. So, we, so it, it, they kept him from carrying out his plan to take over the Greek islands. Verse 19, then he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Verse 20, there shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes. How many know taxes weren't popular then as we're going to see, and how many know they're not popular now? Amen? Isn't it funny how we have to live in our budgets, but how many of the government doesn't have to, right? Just keep raising taxes. I, I, you know, I love it. I love my, my, my house property doesn't increase much, but my taxes increase really good, right? I wish my house value increased as much as my taxes, right? But there you go. All right. Impose taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Antiochus turned back to his own land, and died inside a temple of one of his gods. Hear this. This historians say this, that he was running out of money because of all his military exploits. So he's had no money. So now he's so desperate for money, he runs into one of his temples and starts stealing gods and starts stealing gold artifacts. And so the people get so enraged that they actually kill him in the temple. Pretty sad ending, right? But he's so desperate. The problem is all of his military ventures, as I said, had taken a tremendous toll on them, the country, financially. And that they had a huge deficit. So in 187 B.C., the next Antiochus announced that he would, hear this, send out a thousand tax collectors throughout Syria, the empire, to tax the people. But hear this, people said, oh, no, you're not. 
So they slipped him some poisonous mushrooms in his dinner, and he died. Can we still do that? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, saying, I'm just kidding. But uh, so he said, no, no taxes, you know what I mean? No taxes. All of this sets the stage for the remainder of chapter 11. So come back next week. You know, like a good so far, they stop right in the middle. Whoa, that's what I'm doing, right? Okay, so he set the stage. There's two individuals, right? Two generals, Antiochus and then the Ptolemy family. Antiochus in the north and Ptolemy family in Egypt in the south. Fighting with Israel, caught in the middle. Israel's caught in the middle. But hear this. Hear this, guys. We're going to see a new person come on the scenes, and this is where it really focuses. Antiochus Epiphanes from Syria. He is a very important person prophetically, for he is a picture and a foreshadowing of the one who's called the vile one, more vile than all these other Ptolemy family and, and um, what's his name, Antiochus, Antiochus family. Because why? He's a picture of the Antichrist. I want to say this. How many know that a lot of times we can be afraid of the last days? Amen? And some of us try to say who the Antichrist is and all this. How many know this? I love what one commentator said. I think it was J. Vernon McGee. There's an Antichrist in every generation. Someone waiting in the wings. Because guess what? G- Satan doesn't know when Jesus is coming back or rapturing us. He doesn't know. So he always has to have somebody ready that he can possess with his Antichrist spirit and put them on the scenes. Amen? How many know back in the, in the, in the 50s, people thought Satan or Hitler was the Antichrist? Makes sense, right? So, and he possibly was the Antichrist at that time. But, but how many know Satan always has someone waiting the wings? There isn't like one Antichrist. It's just someone's waiting the wings for Satan to possess and fill. But hear this, guys. With that, we can get afraid, can't we? We can say, oh my goodness, the Antichrist. I hear people say, oh, Obama's the Antichrist. No, 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 no. But hear this. We can get afraid. We can say, oh my goodness, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. But hear this, guys. We need to be not looking for the Antichrist. We need to be looking. The Bible, Jesus said, when you see all this stuff happening, wars, rumors of wars, famines, craziness, Al-Qaeda. He didn't say that, but that's part of that, craziness. He says, look up, for your redemption draws near. Amen? Look up. You should be looking for Jesus. How many know nothing needs to happen for us to be raptured? We could, I could be preaching right now. Boom, we're gone. We're, we're done. And how many are excited about that? I want that so bad. Calgon, take me away. Jesus, take me away. Get us out of here. Amen? But hear this, guys. We still need to occupy, amen? We can't just say, Jesus, take the wheel and just close our eyes and let the car drive right off the cliff. We need to do our best to say, as long as we're here, we're going to preach Christ. We're going to speak the, word, the, love, the words of God in love. We're going to pray, Amen? But hear this. I want to encourage you with this. Since I gave you a lot of history, turn with me. I don't have this scripture, so Alyssa, you need to write this down. 2 Timoth- or Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. So turn with me, if you would, there. But I want to end with this, because I thought this was kind of cool, because I, didn't want to le- I don't want to le- uh, end on a downer with the Antichrist. Amen? How many agree with that? Don't like him? Don't, don't want anything to do with him? But how many know we need to know, here's what I want to tell you, we need to know about the Antichrist, don't we? Because how many know that in the last days, those who aren't saved, if you're here today and you're not saved, get saved. Because how many know you do not want to meet the Antichrist? And hear this, you're going to have a double whammy if you're not saved and you go through tribulation, or if your family or friends, friends don't know Christ. This should motivate you to want to share Christ. Because here it is. It isn't just the Antichrist you've got to worry about. It isn't just the Antichrist who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Now you also have the wrath of God. Amen? Revelation 6 says, it says, the wrath of God is now, in the tribulation period, is going to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Those who rejected the Lamb. How many of you got double whammy? You got the wrath of Satan because the church is gone, so he's free to go crazy. But you also have the wrath of God. So you have wrath of the two, only two powers in the whole world. How many do not want to be there for that? And I always love people that say mid-trib and post-trib. They're going to be through the whole trip. Really. I always say to people, if you want to be here, God bless you. But I believe God wants us out of here. How many know that? He says he's not predestined us for wrath. He wants us out. And I don't just say that because I'm a Calvary. I say that because I believe the Bible says that. Amen? And we'll see it right here. So where am I? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 
It says, I'm reading from the New Living, so if it freaks you out. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the rapture. And how we will be gathered to meet him. Meet him in the air. Verse 2, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say the day of the Lord has already begun. How many know that? People are saying, hey, guys, the rapture has already happened. You're staying here. You're going through the tribulation. How many of that would freak you out? We used to do that. I'll tell you this story. In Bible college, we had a lot of time on our hands. In Bible college, I took our whole floor. I was the dorm god, we called us. I was over the, the people on the floor. But I said, guys, what I want us to do is put your clothes all over like your bed, your floor, just like a person like left their body. And so I had the whole floor. So these guys were coming off work at about 1130 at night. And we had the whole floor. We're hiding. And we're looking at, we're like spying on them. And they were like, they came in. And we, we had clothes on the bathroom, toilet. We had clothes everywhere. So look at, so people, huh! and they're like running through the thing. And it was, it was, it was pretty fun. We scared them. They thought they were left behind, but it was deep. So anyway, so you, if you want to do that at home, feel free to steal that from me. But anyways, but these people were told that, hey, the rapture is happening. You're going through tribulation. That would freak you out, right? So he's, Paul's saying, don't, no, 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 don't be, don't be shaken. Don't be alarmed by those who say the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the tribulation, Amen. There's the day of the Lord and there's the day of Christ. It says the, the day of Christ. The day of Christ is the rapture. That's when we're raptured, taken out of here. The day of the Lord is once we're taken out and then the tribulation becomes, be, begins. And that goes from the beginning of the tribulation all the way to the end of the millennial kingdom is the day of the Lord because he's going to be judging. And so there you go. He says, uh, the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have a spiritual, had a spiritual vision or revelation or a letter supposedly from us. There was a false letter going around. Verse 3, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion or great falling away. Some of your versions say, how many know that? There's a great apostasy. Now we can argue that. Some people say, can you lose yourself? You know, apostasy means a willful rebellion. But how many know, do you not see a great apostasy in the church today? Do you not see people say, oh yeah, I used to believe in Jesus. I, I don't know, I, I think it was uh, Dr. Carlton Pearson. You remember, he's a black pastor. He's a five-generation pastor. And now he's into, he was up in, uh, charismatic guy, he was up in uh, Oklahoma. He now is with, Deep, is it Deepak Chopra, the new age guy? He's with him. He doesn't believe in, in hell anymore. He doesn't believe in Jesus being the only way. He was five-generation pastor. He'd been a pastor his whole life. He just turned away uh, like five, six years ago. I mean, that's crazy. Amen. Five-generation pastor, and he's now just fallen away from God, doesn't believe in hell, total new ager. There's a great apostasy going on, and we need to know that. But he says, uh, don't be fooled, uh, rebellion. Against God and the man of lawlessness, what's that? The Antichrist is revealed. The one who brings destruction or the abomination of desolation, he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. Because he's going to come in the temple, remember, and say he's God. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Verse 5, don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back. Hear that. How many like that? What's holding him back? Yeah, there you go. And for he can be, be, re, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. Verse 7, for the lawlessness is already at work. How many see that already? There's the spirit of Antichrist. How many know the Antichrist isn't here yet, but the spirit of Antichrist against Christ, we see that spirit in our, in our government, already at work secretly. And it will remain secret. How many like that? So we're not going to see it totally come crazy in our, in our lifetime. Until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Who, who knows who that is besides Dwayne? Who, who's, who's keeping him? It's us. You, Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you, the church. Now some people say the Holy Spirit will be taken out. That's not true because people are going to get saved in the, in the tribulation. You need the Holy Spirit to get saved. But we, the restrainer, Christ in us, us speaking out, us praying, us interceding, us voting is the restrainer of evil. We keep the Antichrist from coming. How many are excited about that? Amen. 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 So don't believe the lie that, oh, we're going to see the Antichrist. Oh, no, the Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Who cares? Here's what you need to know. 
the Antichrist is coming and he's ready, but hear this, you want to share Christ so your friends and family don't see the Antichrist. You get it? That's the good of this, right? We're trying to turn this to be positive. Hear this, you need to be motivated. The Antichrist is coming. You, if you're in Christ, you're not going to see him, but you want all your friends and family members and coworkers to not see the Antichrist either. And some people say, oh, if I see him, then I'll know it's real and I'll believe. Yeah, and you're probably going to have to die to get saved, to remain saved. You're going to have to die because you're not going to be able to eat or drink. Can you imagine that without a mark? That would be pretty hard. Can you imagine being in Arizona right now in the summer with no air conditioning, no food? It would be crazy. But hear this. Uh, Holding him back. Verse 8. The man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth. That's some powerful breath, right? I mean, no, it says a sword, right, in Revelation. But the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. How many of that's talking about the coming when we come back with the Lord? How many are excited about that? When we have a seven-year honeymoon, we come back and rule and reign with him. I've got Maui. You're invited. You can come anytime. <laughs> but, you know, we rule and reign. But hear that, guys. Know that. The Antichrist is not going to come or reveal himself until we're gone. But hear that. We need to be motivated to share Jesus with our friends and family. How many know? How many feel the pressure? Anyone feel any pressure to be silent? Keep your religion to yourself? How many know, as I've said before, that when, when the schools and the libraries say that puts the Bible in the top 10 feared books, most controversial feared books, and the Koran isn't in there, how many know something's wrong? But why? Because there's an antichrist spirit. It's not the anti. But remember, there will be John said an antichrist spirit. It's against Christ. There's a spirit in these last days that's against Christ. But how many know? Greater is Christ who's in you. How many know? Hear this. Write this down of your note taker. Luke ten, eighteen and nineteen. Jesus said, I, "All I've seen Satan cast into heaven like lightning." Remember, he cast him out because he tried to rebel against God. And then what happened? He says, "I've given you all authority." He has all authority, but now he's given it to you and I as Christians. I've given you all authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and all power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. How many know we need to start exercising our authority? We need to start praying and binding the demonic, that antichrist spirit that is pervading, that spirit that says, don't talk about Jesus. Talk about anything else, but don't talk about Jesus. How many know your friends and family members and coworkers are dying to know what you know? And they will literally die if they don't know what you know. Amen? So we have to pray. We have to speak up because people need to know Jesus is not a way. He is the only way. Amen? How many like that ending? Better? Better than the soap opera? All right. Praise God. And so that's it. Tell people about Jesus and know that you're not going to see the Antichrist. Hear this? I want to end with this one last verse. It's in Luke, I forget where, 18, where he says, when you see all this stuff, when you see all the craziness that we're seeing, look up. Fear redemption draws near. Don't be looking for the Antichrist. Be looking for Jesus. Be crying out, Hosanna, save now. Come now, amen? Come, save us now, amen? I want him so bad. I, I tell you, when I worship, I almost, if I wasn't so heavy, I'd jump into the, through the ceiling. I mean, I was so excited about Jesus' return. And, you know, I mean, I uh, can't wait. So anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this soap opera and this a lot of a uh, lot of names to remember a lot of kingdoms a lot of two generals antiochus and, and ptolemy family but lord thank you that we're not going to see antiochus we're not going to see antiochus epiphanes we're not going to see the antichrist because we you and us your holy spirit is restraining so father let us be those good restrainers lord let us be those good people who as you said whatever we bind on earth we bound in heaven teach us how to pray Amen? Teach us how to pray and take the authority that you've given us. You said all authority has been given to you in heaven and earth, and now you've given it to us. Let us learn how to not for pray for authority for lear jets and selfish things, but, Lord, to pray for the souls of, uh, of men, to pray for our coworkers, to pray for our lost family members, to pray for the, 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 the administration of this country, to say, God, turn them back to you. And to know that there's demonic forces trying to manipulate them, trying to, to get them with have an antichrist spirit. But Lord, greater is Christ. Sometimes, Lord, I can humbly say, I sometimes believe the lie that Satan is an equal foe to you. And that is not true. 
We see that when you, Jesus, dealt with demons. They cried out and said, Oh, Lord, why did you come to torment us before the time? They were terrified of you. Let us remember how powerful our God is. Amen? Let us remember that you restrain evil. You, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Your Holy Spirit restrains. But Lord, let us be so filled with you that we're not looking for the Antichrist. But we're saying, Lord, we want to see this world as a ship that is sinking. And we have the life preserver, Jesus Christ, and we want to throw that life preserver to everyone that will take it. We want to throw the life preserver of Jesus to anyone who will listen, anyone who will take it. And so, Father, let us not leave barely hanging on, but let us leave victorious because you have won the war and you ask us now to win the battles in Tucson, Arizona, to win the battles in Arizona, to win the battles for our country again. And Father, as I've said, I, I, I hear the enemy speaking through a lot of our candidates, and I heard one of them say that, you know, they're going to try to take us back to the 1950s. How many like to go back to the 1950s? They said it was one of the best times in our country. Lord Jesus, let us want your will. Let us cry out and believe that we are not just to let go of the wheel and say, Jesus, come back, but we are to say, Lord, we long for you to come back, amen? But until you do, we're going to occupy. We're going to pray. We're going to cry out. We're going to speak the truth in love. We're going to vote for the most biblical candidate we can, even if it's hard. Lord, we're going to do our part because, Lord, I pray for everyone here. That when we rapture, when we're raptured, or when we're, we die and meet you, whatever it is you choose for us, that we can say like Paul, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. Now lays up for me a crown of righteousness. That, that basically what I'm saying is that none of us would die with regret. None of us would die. That we would live every day. That if we were to die tonight, we could say, I gave my all to God. I prayed, I studied his word, I spoke the truth in love to everyone you would let me bring in my path. I was totally given to your will, God. It wasn't my will that I was living for. It wasn't my job. It wasn't my pleasures. It was you, Lord Jesus. Let us, this church and others like it, be blessed that we could die well or be raptured well. We wouldn't be raptured going, oh no! We'd be raptured saying, oh yes, Thank you, Lord. I'm so excited to see you. Bless your people, Lord. Encourage them. And let us not be waiting for the Antichrist, but let us be looking up and waiting to meet you in the clouds in your Shekinah glory, to meet you and be taken into heaven for a seven-year honeymoon. Oh, God, I look so forward to that. Amen? We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.